Thanks very much. I'd like to thank BIO and uh, the state of Iowa for this award, and uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I thought I'd just talk a little bit about um, some of the work that led up to what we've been doing, um, and I wanted to tell you a little story. Um, I was in Africa at the beginning of the year. I was there for a conference on artemisinin. Uh, this was a conference for the producers and extractors of artemisinin. Artemisinin is the drug of choice for treating malaria. Artemisinin is an ancient Chinese therapy. It was first discovered in about 150 BC by some uh, doctors in China. Um, and the reason we have it today is because they wrote it in some textbooks that uh, were laid to rest with some ancient Chinese uh, emperors. About 1960 uh, or earlier, Mao said to his medical corps, I need, need a new treatment for malaria. They were fighting in Vietnam and the drugs that were available based on quinine were no longer effective. So he sent his medical corps out to find a new treatment. They poured through the literature and they found some writings for how to make artemisinin, how to extract it from the plant that produces it naturally, and how to formulate it into a drug. In about 1972, we had the first structure for the drug artemisinin. So about 2003, the World Health Organization decided to designate this as the drug of choice for treating malaria. Immediately, the price of artemisinin went through the roof. Farmers started planting it. They planted an overabundance of it primarily in Vietnam, but later in China and other parts of the world. Two years later, after that first uh, designation as the drug of choice, the price plummeted because there was an oversupply of artemisinin. And then two years after that, the price started to go back up again. Now, because of these long lag times, most of the companies that develop drugs based on artemisinin have economists employed and those economists jobs are to predict how much drug they're going to need and to make sure that they have contracts in place. It takes about two years for the cycle of planting to the time they get artemisinin in their hands. And because of that, we have these large swings in price and large swings in availability. So back to Africa. I was, I was in Africa for this meeting. And after the meeting, I went to a uh, western city of Kisumu. And I met uh, a boy named George. He was at a clinic in Kisumu. And I knew something was wrong when I first saw him. It was about 95 degrees outside, and George was wearing a heavy coat. He, he's four years old. He came in with his brother of about seven. His nose was running, and you could tell that he wasn't feeling well, low energy. The nurse sat him down, pricked his finger, put a drop of blood on a small device that she pulled out of a package and realized they have no electricity. She added a couple of drops of buffer and 30 seconds later she had the diagnos diagnosis that George had malaria. So she weighed him and she pulled out a packet, a blister packet that contained six tablets in it. Those six tablets were an artemisinin combination therapy made by Novartis. And she instructed his brother, she said, okay, I'm going to give him a pill now, and every 12 hours he needs to take another pill. And then she turned to me and she said, you know, Jay, she said, he's not going to take all of these because his mother's going to know that he feels better after the third pill. And so she's going to save those other three pills. She's going to save it for the next time he has malaria because he'll get it again and again and again. 80% of the people in this region have malaria. And because he's not going to take the full treatment, that plasmodium is eventually gonna grow resistant to the artemisinin. And this is the last drug we have available to us. So this really indicated to me and, and brought it home how important it is to have alternative processes for these. And I wanna just explain where this alternate process came from. So about 2001, we were working on engineering microbes to produce chemicals. And one of my graduate students brought to me a research paper on artemisinin, describing the first step in the biosynthetic pathway. And we looked at the molecule and we said, gosh, this looks like something we could produce. I hadn't heard about malaria since I took an undergraduate class in microbiology. 
and we didn't know anything about artemisinin. So we started working on it, we synthesized the gene, we put it into E. coli, it didn't work very well, we continued to optimize E. coli to produce it till we got enough evidence to publish a paper and then go to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and get $42 million to actually build a, a full-scale microbe to produce artemisinic acid, a precursor to artemisinin, to scale up the process and get it out to people who need it. That entire process uh, took us from the time we got the grant in 2004 till about 2013, this year, in fact, is when we announced full-scale commercial production of the process. We completed the research in my laboratory in 2007. Along the way, we had created Amaris. Their first goal was to fully optimize the microbe that produces this important anti-malarial drug and then in 2009, we licensed the process to Sanofi Aventis, one of the largest manufacturers of artemisinin combination therapies. We, one caveat, they can have the license to the process and they can have it exclusively, but they can't make any money from it. Amherst didn't make any money from it. University of California didn't make any money from it. And Sanofi wouldn't make any money from it. In fact, they said, we'll take the money that we earn from travelers and we use that to reduce the cost for people in the developing world so that we can reduce the cost, increase the supply. Recall that I told you it takes two years from the time you plant the seeds till the time a pharma company has artemisinin in its hands. With this new process, it takes a matter of weeks. You fire up the fermenter, you get the microbe out of the freezer. It's just like brewing beer, you get artemisinic acid. And then you convert it using a photochemical process into artemisinin, and you get the very same product that you had from the plant. When uh, this went live this year, Sanofi announced that they had produced 35 tons of artemisinin. That's enough for 70 million people. And on an annual basis, they plan to produce enough drug for 120 million people. That's roughly half of the number of treatments that are needed on an annual basis. Now, that original yeast that we engineered to produce artemisinin is a host for a whole range of renewable products. Drugs, fuels, flavors, fragrances, cosmetics, and even replacement rubber for tires. And that microbial platform is the basis for Amaris. And currently, there are about 300 buses running in Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro on Amaris diesel. They've logged uh, a few million miles on that diesel. But there are other platforms that other companies have developed, and I think what we're seeing is a real rise in this area. It's, it's, it has a very bright future. But don't get me wrong, biological engineering is still extremely challenging to do. The creation of that original microbe took $25 million and about 150 person years worth of work. These costs and development times aren't atypical for the industry, but they're way too long. My fellow synthetic biologists and I hope to reduce the time and cost to uh, develop biological solutions to some of the world's most significant problems by developing tools to speed the engineering of biology. Engineering microbes to produce chemicals is just the start. I anticipate a day when engineered microbes colonize our intestines and help fight disease. Replacement organs can be, uh, can be grown in a petri dish from our own stem cells so that we don't suffer rejection. And plants will need little water or fertilizer to produce food for the world's growing population and renewable fuels that do not add carbon to the atmosphere when they're burned. These challenges, though, won't be met by single investigator research, as we've seen biology, in academics at least, in the past. Bio biological engineering will require teams of researchers working together to tackle these important challenges. It will take industry and academics working together. And I think the Artemisinin project is one example of many examples out there where academics and industry are working closer and closer together to bring these projects to fruition. I have the fortune to be a part of a large team of biological scientists at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory where we have 800 biologists working on biological solutions to help solve uh, the planet's biggest problems in energy, health, environment, and manufacturing. We'll help to solve these major problems by creating teams and creating foundational tools to engineer biological systems. We also plan to team with industry to speed and ease technology transfer. 
but we need to know what industry wants. And so we're going to be working closely with you. And on July 18th in Washington, D.C., we plan to sponsor with several agencies a listening uh, session where we hear what industry needs most so that we can, as academics, deliver to industry what you need and that we can speed technology transfer from the laboratory to people. Again, I'd like to thank BIO for this award, the state of Iowa for sponsoring the award, and you for your time and attention.